thank you all for turning up in large numbers here today. Thank you very much. Let's hope that uh, post-lunch session we'll be able to keep you nudged into being awake and <laughs> perhaps find this exciting enough. We have a very distinguished panel today, very diverse panel. Monica Will Silver, uh, Sartika Kushana Fiea, Sogato Dutta, John Gachigi, and Benjamin Kumpf. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, let me just kick off by introducing my, myself and uh, Global Innovation Fund. I am Gulzar Natarajan. I'm a senior managing director at the Global Innovation Fund. We are uh, a charity registered in uh, London, funded by uh, the development agencies of four national governments, US, UK, Australia, and Sweden, and by Omidia Networks. We have a mandate of supporting innovations which have evidence of impact on the lives of people living below poverty line and which have the potential to scale. We have the mandate of doing so in a flexible manner, supporting both uh, risk capital and grant investments, support giving uh, equity and structured debt to risk capital for-profit for firms and grants to non-profit entities. Uh, we have a portfolio, we currently have a portfolio of, of around 35 grants and uh, risk capital investments in uh, different parts of uh, Africa and Asia, uh, mostly Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Southeast Asia, and parts of, partly in Southeast Asia. Uh, the, the, we, don't, we do not have a sector uh, uh, or thematic uh, <coughs> prioritization or focus, uh, but we are very excited about uh, some of the uh, projects in our portfolio, especially relating to uh, behavioral interventions. In particular, we are excited about a couple of uh, projects which we are supporting. Uh, perhaps two of the leading organizations were engaged in development uh, behavioral interventions, IDS42 and BIT. And uh, we're very happy that uh, uh, we could use this opportunity of this panel to showcase the work that uh, they've done and uh, uh, the country representatives as part of the project. So I'll, I'll first request uh, each of my panelists to make a brief introduction about themselves, their organization, and the work they're doing, which is relevant to the, uh, the, the session today. Monica, may I request you first? First of all, thank you very much, Gulzar, and thank you very much to everyone for being here today after lunch on a Friday. It's very exciting to have a full room for this session, so it's wonderful to see you all here. As Gulzar say, my name is Monica Wills. I am a principal advisor in our international development team at BIT, and hopefully by this point the Behavioral Insights team doesn't require an introduction. I hope you're kind of familiar and probably a bit tired of hearing about us. So what I want to do in this session is tell you about the fantastic work that we've been doing with wonderful teams around the world in the last three years. So since roughly 2016, we have been working in collaboration with the Global Innovation Fund, as, Glo as Goldstar was discussed, then telling you about. And we have been working in Guatemala, in Indonesia, and in Bangladesh, setting up behavioral insights capacities. In the government of Guatemala, we have been working with the tax authority and with the Ministry of Education. In the government of Bangladesh, we have been working with A2I, which is Access to Information, which is a team that was set up within the Prime Minister's office, and now is in their uh, CTI division. And they're working and leading the digital agenda in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, we're also working with BRAC, which is the largest NGO working in international development around the world, based in Bangladesh. And then in Indonesia, we're working with the Tax Authority and with the Social Security Authority. And my colleague Tika, uh, who's from the Social Security Authority, uh, which has a great acronym, which I'm going to try and do, which is BPJSTK, <laughs> um, <laughs> will come after me and will tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing together in, in Indonesia. Um, and if you're looking at this map and you're hearing me speak about these organizations, you're probably thinking, 
these are very different contexts and these are very different organizations. And you're absolutely right. So as different as this context has been, so has been the process of setting up behavioral insights capacities, and so have been the process of figuring out where the data is, what type of data we can use, what types of interventions can we actually implement. However, the more we reflect on this process and the work that we've been doing with them over the past three years, the more we start to identify common topics across the three countries that I wanna share with you today, because I think if you're in the session, it's basically because you want to learn about how we're going about setting up behavioral insights capacity around the world and in low and middle income countries specifically. So there's like three um, lessons that I want to leave with you in this opening remarks. The first one is that this is an extremely collaborative process for us. So uh, in the slide, I'm sharing with you our methodology tests, which I'm not going to bore you with at this point. If you want the descriptions in there, but basically what we've been doing with this, all of the organizations in these projects is to run behavioral science jointly, to join behavioral insights projects jointly, going through all of the stages of our methodology and trying to define those projects that work best for each country and for each context. And what's important here is that it's a mutual learning process. It's not only us coming in with the behavioral science knowledge and with the experimentation expertise, with the trial design expertise, is about how much we also learn from our partners in country because they are the experts in their context, they're the experts in their organizations, in their processes. So as much as we can bring uh, to, the, to these countries, they also teach us about how we can adapt these interventions and to make them culturally relevant for each one of the, of the countries. So the first thing is that it's a very collaborative process. Each stage we define together, each decision is taken together. The second thing is that, as you can imagine, this is a process of um, getting, convincing people, basically. It's a process of trying to convince that this is something that they should be doing, is bringing people on board with, which, with why behavioral science should be something that these countries should be doing as well. And what we find frequently is that in many countries there are, for instance, civil servants that have been in the same role for over 20, 10 years, doing the same things over and over again, uh, which have, who have very set ways to go about policy making. And a lot of the times it's a convincing process and we found it very useful to try and identify initially a quick win. So what is that low hanging fruit? What is that first trial that we can do with them that will show that this can work in different countries and specifically in their context? And, and I think Less, less so now, but we used to get this question quite a lot a couple of years ago when we started this program of work. And it's that our partners would tell us, very nice that that works in the UK, very nice that that works in Europe, very nice that that works in the US, but will it work here? Will it work in more complex contexts? Will it work with, where there's less data available, where, where it's not as easy to implement an intervention? And I think increasingly we're finding that the answer is yes, but it is a convincing process and sometimes finding those easy trials at the beginning gets you a long way. And then the third thing that I wanted to mention very briefly in this introduction is that a key part of this process has been the people. And uh, I would divide this into two, that two dimensions. The first dimension would be trying to secure very high level, senior level support from the beginning of these trials. And we've done that in a number of ways, be that introductory meetings to explain what this means and why it's relevant, telling them about what other countries in the region are doing and why it would, could apply in their case specifically. And for instance, in the case of Guatemala, we've had the pleasure of working with uh, the head of the tax authority who's very supportive of this, of this work that we have been doing. And that's meant that it's been really easy to set up the team within the tax, tax authority. And the other level is the technical people that we're working with, which are, who are absolutely fundamental to the work that we're doing. And uh, I think beyond just building the capacities of those teams and the people that we've identified that understand and like are familiar with the methodologies that we are, we've developed also with them, it's also seeing how we can institutionalize this process within the organization so that the knowledge just doesn't stay with those people that were working with us. So it's, it's also about seeing those people as multipliers that start training others and creating that toolkit within the, each organization so that they can start using it um, uh, as we leave. Because I think one concern that we have sometimes is that as government changes, for instance, the teams might get dissolved. 
So I think institutionalizing the team as such and the toolkits as well as the training within the organizations gets you a long way in making sure that that multiplier effect remains. And I just want to conclude with a very brief story that I think kind of helps illustrate that multiplying effect that I'm talking about. So with the team in Guatemala, we have been doing, we did three trials jointly, but now they're running their own trial. And the way we've been doing this is by video conferences. So every fortnight, I log in, we have a session for roughly four hours where they take me through the steps of every trial that they're designing and what types of solutions they're developing, for instance. And in the first session, we run the first introductory, this is behavioral science, this is experimentation. One of the members of the team, Juan Carlos, who's actually here today, um, has been working with us for almost four years because he was working with us in a previous trial that we run with the tax authority in Guatemala, and he's been familiarizing himself with the type of uh, projects that we do. And he was sitting there that day. But we started struggling with the connection, and I couldn't get through, and it started, it was basically a problem that we were having with our connection, rather the connection in Guatemala, so the office here in London had the issue. And then at some point it drops out completely, I cannot get through, I'm really worried because I have nine people in the room waiting for me to tell them about behavioral science and I can't get through to them. I managed to get the video on again and I come to this image where Juan Carlos is saying, and that is what is behavioral science. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, they don't need us anymore. So I think that helps illustrate that multiplying effect and I look forward to the discussion with the panel and a pleasure to have you all today. Thank you, Monica. Article. May I also request you to talk about your acronym? <laughs> acronym, okay. No problem. Briefly. Hi, everyone. Um, this is my name, that given by my parents. It's long, yeah, I know, and the last name is so a little bit different. Uh, I, I mean, a little bit difficult to pronounce. So just call me Tika. So um, I work at BBJS Ketanakerjaan, Indonesia. And uh, for sure you can call it just BBJS TK. No, it's BBJS TK. It's not TK, BBJS TK. <laughs> um, Indonesia. And for those who do not know yet what BBJS TK is, um, we do similar work with the national insurance here in the UK. So, and for those who don't know yet, where Indonesia is, uh, let me give you two uh, key words, Jokowi and then Bali. Yes. <laughs> Bali is a part of Indonesia, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And uh, for, to give you a picture where my, <coughs> well, I am a, I'm the head of the research team there, I mean in BBJS Teka, not in the national insurance in UK. So if uh, I want you, I want to give you a picture where I sit in this big organization. There's my president directors and he has several directors here and this is uh, where my directors uh, sit, strategic planning and IT. And he has also several deputy directors and this is where I sit uh, in deputy director of strategic planning. And this is me, here I am. Mm -hmm. Social Security Research and Development Team, SSRNG. So really scientific, right? So these two are my older brothers. They, they were here since forever. I don't know when, since when. So here I am. It's really small. I mean, not too small. And what we are doing, oh, and there's one m magic uh, case here. Um, this is established last year, 2018, but we have been working with BIT since 2017. So mind blowing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what 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 do what did we do with uh, BIT? We just finished our first project, and it's about uh, to how to decrease uh, the number of companies that have uh, contribution areas with us. So we decided to create a reminder email and we ferried the messages in the email uh, to four kind of um, messages, social norm, risk of prosecution, risk to employees and planning. And the winning email is the risk of prosecution uh, because yeah, 
it it's it well it threat it give them some threats I think but yeah we, you just if, if you just download the final the final report of the uh, this project in PIT website just you can see how the message is framed here in this so there is a prosecution email uh, increase the number of employees ah sorry the number of the companies that pay contribution on on time by 500 companies and it also increased the repayments of the arrears for around 716,000 US dollars. So that's our first project. And what's next? These three columns. So what's next? We have a new BI project with BIT and I hope this will be the last time. Um, so the project number two is, well, we are going to, well, punching the faces of the companies again, but for the different reason. Uh, this time is to reduce, to reduce the underreporting that done by the company in terms of the uh, employee salaries and their, the number of employees that they employed. Um, and then, we also want to encourage this BI in our toolbox of even evidence-based policy making. So one of the reasons the management established my team, the research team, is to encourage more uh, evidence-based policy making. So we already have some tools there in our toolbox. So it's the ordinary research, usual research, the qualitative, quantitative mix of both and studies, 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 literature studies, test studies, something like that, and survey. And now we, we will add this behavioral <coughs> insight into our toolbox. And the third is the capacity building for our team. So learning by doing with BIT um, is the most effective and inexpensive way to learn how to implement the BI project in the field. So from the start, BIT just um, involved us with the process of doing this project. And uh, from that, we also know how, we also understand uh, from the practical point of view, uh, how to do this thingy. I mean, this um, <laughs> behavioral insight project. And well, and to be practical, we have to know the background theories and the textbook theory uh, so that we can explain to other people uh, in the practical way from the textbook. What, what, oh my God, okay. So we, we do this, the, the independent studies, and also we took some uh, related courses and we already did the study visit and we visit the uh, BIT office across the street, where's the street there? I think. <laughs> yeah, and well, from that study visit, we can experience from the first hand how it feels to work in behavioral insight-ish environment. So that's my story. Thanks. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please, please, let's keep it five, yep. five minutes and then we can have it in discussion. Uh, thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. So I am uh, Shogato Datta. I'm managing director at Ideas42, where I oversee uh, most of our international work in Asia and Africa. And um, you may be a little less familiar with us than with BIT, one would imagine. But um, I think we are organizations motivated by very similar goals, which is the application of behavioral insights learnings from behavioral economics, behavioral science, to a variety of settings and problems and issues across the world. And um, we, our work covers, obviously, a lot of different domains because, of course, human behavior is sort of central to policy outcomes pretty much in any domain or any, for any area of work that one can think of. Um, and, of course, we also do this all around the world. So we got our start in the United States originally as a research unit within Harvard. And then we rapidly realized that to make real impact in the world, 
we had to leave the confines of academia and try to do this with partners who actually work in the real world. And um, initially, we worked in the US. But since 2011, when I came on board, we've been rapidly, I think, expanding our footprint across the world. And this is just a small selection of the projects that we've done in a variety of different areas um, across the world. Um, and uh, I would say it's about 35 to 40 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America where we have had various kinds of engagements, all of which for the, you know, or at least most of which involve a very similar process of defining a behavioral problem, diagnosing what's going on, trying to design solutions that use behavioral interventions to actually have impact, and then trying to test them and scale them. And the scaling piece, I think, is what I want to spend a little bit of the next couple of minutes talking about uh, here today, because that's actually what we've really begun to explore with the generous support from the Global Innovation Fund. And I'm not going to go over the slide, but just to say there's lots of ways in which one could think about scaling something across the world. And there are a couple of different ways of doing this that we have begun to explore um, with funding from GIF. And one of them is a program of work which is very focused on a particular issue, which is about bringing behavioral design to cash transfer programs. So social protection programs, which give money to poor people on a regular basis across the world, um, really could benefit from being more behaviorally informed, being more um, sort of cognizant of and designed in light of the way people actually make decisions and take action. And this is work that we've been doing jointly with uh, the World Bank, uh, whose social protection and jobs group has been extremely supportive and extremely instrumental in allowing us to forge partnerships with country governments and the agencies who actually are the ones conducting these programs. And, a, and, a, and a, so maybe a slightly, at this point, smaller piece of work that we've also begun is to think about a different scale pathway. And this is to think about areas such as increasing revenues or for governments or um, tackling resource use, for example, reducing or conserving water, <laughs> um, conserving electricity, where we have good evidence. But now we want to see whether governments, particularly local governments, who are the ones who have to supply these th services and raise these revenues across the world, can actually use behavioral insights to do this more efficiently, and only that can they actually do this on a pay for performance basis where they are able to actually cover these services out of the savings generated or the revenue generated. And so um, this is the cash transfer work and you'll hear more about the work in Kenya from Mr. Gashigi who is our key partner in country. Um, but we're working currently in three countries, Tanzania, Kenya and Ghana, in each of which we're trying to incorporate behavioral insights and test their efficacy on a variety of behaviors ranging from human development outcomes like education and health all the way through uh, financial outcomes like savings or investment. Um, and this is the idea of what we're calling the city nudge accelerator, which is going to ideally be a way that many more cities around the world are able to use behavioral insights and improve the outcomes that they care about and do it in a way that does not require continued donor funding, but is something that sustains itself. And so. Obviously, we'll talk more about all of this uh, in the rest of the panel, but this is the work that we've been up to. Thank you. Thank you, Sagato. John, I request you to briefly explain about uh, your work, yourself, your work, and we can save the details for the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> My name is John Gashige. <coughs> I work with the Minister of Labor and Social Protection. I had the social assistance unit. This is the unit which is in charge of managing the cash transfer programs in Kenya. Uh, <clears throat> and the cash transfer program is uh, the unit I, I, I sit in manages the cash transfer. And this is a government supported program whereby we offer management support, sorry, where we, we offer administrative support working with the development partners. And I'm happy to report that here. One of our major development partners is seated with us here, DFID. We also work very closely with the World Bank, World Food Program, and the UNICEF. But the program we are implementing is the constitute of the National Safety Net Program. And currently, we are targeting about 1.33 million household, 
And if you multiply by the average household size, which is in Kenya is about six members, meaning that our money is reaching up to about 800 million, 8 million beneficiaries who are benefiting from this money. And the money we normally transfer, it is a cash team paid we normally give after every one month, but we normally do it after every two months because of administrative cost. So the, the cash transfer programs consist of three pro, four programs. The first one is called the older persons cash transfer. And this is a universal pension scheme targeting the senior citizens who are 70 years and above, where we give them a cash stimpet. The second one is called the persons with the severe disability cash transfer. This is a pra, trans, cash transfer targeting people with the severe disability. And the way we define a severe disability is that person who require 24 hour care and support, they need a caregiver to take care of them. An example is a, a person maybe with the, <coughs> sorry, is maybe somebody who cannot support themselves in any way, way, way or another, so they require maybe a mother or a caregiver to take care of them. The other one is called the cash transfer for the orphans and vulnerable children. These are the children who are below 18 years. They could be double orphans, they could be single orphans, or they could be children living under vulnerable conditions. Maybe they have the both parents, but for one reason or the other, Maybe the parents, they are either facing, they are disabled, they are chronically sick, or maybe they are homeless or something like that. And finally, the other one is called Hunger Safety Net Program. This is a program targeting the arid and semi-arid areas, those people in the marginal areas, and they are the ones who are resource poor. So what are some of the strategic interventions we are undertaking in order to ensure that our programs are properly implemented? One is beneficiary outreach strategy. This is a strategy which makes us now to engage with the beneficiaries on a day-to-day basis so that we can be able to know what are their problems. We also train them on how to take responsibility about the, the money we are giving them. And in case they have got complaints and grievances, they're able to, to respond back. It is a strategy which is well structured from the national level or to the beneficiary level. And we have a... Um, we have a, a module within our MIS system whereby the beneficiaries are supposed to, 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 to respond to some of those issues on their own. And then we have got the beneficiary welfare committees. These are structures which are made of beneficiaries themselves, whereby they are able now to interact on themselves, and then they also they work like a bridge between the government and themselves. And then for the delivery mechanism of the money we normally provide, we have an account-based payment model whereby we transfer money to the beneficiaries using bank accounts. And those bank accounts are supposed to have a, a saving value whereby beneficiaries can save money and they can withdraw money at their convenience. And the banks don't charge them any, any, any transaction fee. The government pay for them in form of the, the commissions we give the banks. And then we have a consolidated cash transfer program MIS. We have an MIS whereby it's a database whereby all the data of our beneficiaries is stored in right from when we do the targeting, when we do the enrollment, when we are doing the payment. And this MIS manages every other every other activity we are doing. It manages our payroll. It also manages the complaints and grievances and also our MNI system. And then finally, we have started working closely with the Ideas 42 for the last two years whereby now we are introducing the behavior nudges process within our beneficiaries. And the reason why we are introducing this one so that we can have the, the, the to, to add value into the cash transfer we are giving to the beneficiaries. And the objective is this one is number one, we want to engage with the beneficiaries to encourage them to save for productive investments. One of the challenges we are having with our beneficiaries is that they don't have a saving culture. And much of the money is used for consumption. And then number two, our beneficiaries tend to think that the money we give them is free money. And therefore, they can maybe use it the way they want. But essentially, it is not free money. It is an entitlement because it is enshrined within our constitution. So it is an entitlement. But the, what we want to change their mindset is that even if it is an entitlement, entitlement comes with a responsibility. So once they get that money, they should be able to, to, to spend it responsibly, maybe by saving and investing. So within the, 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 the two years we have been working with the, on behavior on RGZ, we have already done piloting in one of the regions. And when we did the piloting, we, we did the piloting, we did the testing, and now we have also now done the, the, the results are there. And the results are showing that there is some positive element, positive in the way we are doing. And this one involves growth setting, 
plan making and saving tracking process whereby the, the beneficiaries, they, they set the goals, they then come up with a plan on how they are going to save, and then we come up with how are they going to track how they are doing the savings, and then we encourage them participatorily to come up with a, with a pooch. It's like a bag whereby they partition part of the money they put the part of the pouch they put the money they are going to use for consumption and other which they are going to, to use for, for the savings. And then after the payment, we said we send them SMS reminders so that we remind them about the the goals they set and whether they are saving up as per the plan. And then we come up with some posters on social norms on how maybe they are supposed to, to work them. And these posters, we, we paste them in the local villages, in the marketplaces, in churches, so that they keep on reminding them. And then finally, there is self-affirmation posters targeting the groups which are able to manage them. So basically, that is what we are doing in Kenya, but we'll discuss more in the plenary. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, the, the last panelist, uh, Ben, represents DFID, so doesn't require any uh, slides or introduction. Ben, can you please speak about a uh, little bit about uh, DFID's uh, engagement with behavioral interventions? Happy to. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Kampf, and I'm the head of innovation of the Department for International Development. And we are a proud partner of the Global Innovation Fund, work together with the Babel Insights team, IDS42, and working with our peers from the governments in Indonesia and Kenya on eradicating poverty, protecting the environment, on good governance and advancing gender equality. And before I mention three concrete reasons why we think investing in behavioral design is the right thing to do from a government perspective, work in international development, let me propose speaking about the present and future of behavioral insights, two big transitions that overlay our work in working in governments to make them more future-proof, which are first, tech progress. We are seeing technology advancing at an unprecedented pace in human history. And the digitalization of economies and our personal lives having huge effects which we yet have to fully explore on identity creation, on social identity creation, on group interactions and social cohesion. And this technological progress faces us as individuals, social groups, but particularly governments with challenges that are, I would argue, paradigm shifts and entirely new. The pace of progress outstrips government's capability to regulate it. So we have to rethink <laughs> regulation, and we have to, in degrees, rethink governance. And the second transition is what we are facing today, a global existential crisis for humanity, the biodiversity and climate crisis. And this requires new macro and microeconomic models. It requires new consumption patterns or altered consumption patterns of humans across the globe. And as it's interdependent on the entire globe, requires governments to work together differently and citizens across the world, particularly social movements, to work together differently. And I argue that those two great transitions overlay how we have to see how government works and how people in the public service see themselves. From the traditional view of public servants to entrepreneurs who think in experiments and are constantly testing what works to the entire concept of an entrepreneurial state that's not about fixing market failures, but shaping sustainable markets. And speaking about the need in government to invest in experimentation, that's the first reason why we at DFID think our cooperation with BIT, with IDS42, through the Global Innovation Fund and in other contexts is the right thing. We need to introduce the right level of humility in public policy and in programming through experimentation. We invest heavily in adaptive management through different programs and behavioral design, which includes investment and qualitative research upfront, is the right thing to do to find out what works. And from an innovation perspective, I argue that a dedicated success factor for innovation is also inclusiveness, working with the people affected by development challenges themselves and engaging these people in the design of interventions and moving forward even in the design of RCTs, bringing human agency back into experimentation on the ground. The second reason is value for money. Through rigorous evaluations, we can see what works. <coughs> that doesn't mean that it can always go to scale, which we'll discuss later at larger scale, but we want to make sure that we deliver value for money of the UK taxpayer funds, essentially, that we're working with our peers in the global south on advancing development. 
And lastly, it's an internal focus. We are all biased. Everyone in this room, everyone at my department. And we have invested heavily in uncovering conscious and unconscious bias in development and policy professionals and through first uncovering it and then designing experiments and intervention, improving the way that we design policies. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. That third point is very relevant to uh, organizations, individuals, and that's perhaps the essence of what uh, we, are, we have been discussing here over the last two days. Thank you. Uh, I'll, we'll now have uh, uh, a panel discussion for the next 20 minutes, and then we'll have question and answer session. So I guess that's the way we'll do it. Uh, Monica and Sogato. Now, based on your work, I mean, when you started engaging with uh, governments uh, on behavioral interventions, what was the initial reaction? What were the challenges that you faced uh, in, in sort of <coughs> getting buy-in? Uh, can you please speak about a little bit about that? Um, I guess uh, Monica spoke a little bit about the issue of how this is a process of convincing people that these things not only matter, but matter in their context. And I would agree with that. That is something that, you know, when we go into a new country where there hasn't been as much work, perhaps, around using these kinds of ideas, um, one of the initial challenges is very much about um, conveying um, the fact that what may seem like very small interventions or very small changes can have these outsize effects. And obviously, that means a lot of process of conversation about what's been done in other contexts and how that might be relevant. But then the second piece of that is trying to really gain an understanding of the specifics of the particular program or the particular thing that um, the government is working on for us, actually, to understand how exactly are these ideas best applied and most usefully applied in this context. Um, and one thing, just in terms of, uh, you talked about um, uh, you know, the low-hanging fruit, and I think that's, that's very important. One thing actually picks up on something that Ben said, which is that you know, we are all biased, right? And that includes all of us. So we may be looking at certain problems which are not problems, but it also applies naturally to the people that we are working with. And something that we've found very useful is being able to maybe even run a small experiment or pilot which actually works with the people that we are working with. So if we are working with a government department that you know, delivers education, um, you know, obviously eventually we want to be able to affect um, the way that education outcomes operate. But if we're able to find something in the context of the way that department operates, which allows us to sort of demonstrate that there's a behavioral bias at play here, I think that's always very powerful because it helps people to see that we're also not being in any way, this is not about being in any way patronizing or be, you know, up to the beneficiaries. We're not saying that they have some specific reason why they are cognitively biased. We're just saying everyone is like this and we can't see it ourselves until someone shows it to us. Um, and so that's something that I found useful. I should have gone first. <laughs> um, no, I guess what I would add to that is that one thing that we've found every time we've come into a new country is that the level of familiarity that the country and the government already has with behavioral science and experimental methods matters a lot. So we managed to get really quick traction in Guatemala, where we had, had done some work before. Uh, because they knew our methodology and they knew about behavioral science, they were very excited about this. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes we come in and people uh, are a bit resistant or reluctant to the idea of trying things new. A little bit about what I was talking about with regards to civil servants that have been doing the same things over and over again for many years and don't want to really invert the model of how they go about doing policy making. So I think one of the things that we say we do in our explore phase, which is fundamental for our international development work, is that it's about learning how the experience is like from the perspective of the citizens, from the perspective of the people that you're trying to target through your interventions. And that means that sometimes we ask policymakers who sit in a like cushiony government department in the city center to go to a rural area and to try and fill out a tax declaration or to try and fill out a bird registration declaration or to try and go through this process and identify what are all of those like barriers that people might be feeling uh, and finding in those processes that they've defined. So I think inverting that model on its head is, is something that like has 
face some resistance initially, but eventually gets people really quickly on board because they notice how difficult it is to file a tax declaration. Yeah. Or it doesn't make sense for you to use very legalistic language when you could say something very clearly. So I think that, that helps quite a bit. Thank you. Uh, Sautika and John, uh, when you went about introducing this in your respective uh, departments, what were the sort of couple of challenges which you sort of recollect top of your head? Um, <clears throat> so um, I was very lucky because uh, we don't have any any big challenges. Uh, so my boss is really open-minded. So I just say, this behavioral insight is good, yada, 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 blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? Yeah. No, so you see, this BIT has a lot of um, research, uh, research result, and it's their their approach is very. They just uh, change the what the simplest thing like uh, changing the words, uh, changing the the order of uh, the uh, points or something like that, and they just uh, have a really impressive result. And, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you just uh, read it by yourself. Okay, so let's go, then do this, and then, okay, that's what's fine. No, so the point about having a boss who is supporting yes. champion, internal exactly. champion is well that, taken. Uh, yeah, yes. that was my former boss, and my current boss, it's just the same. So I was, <laughs> I was, I was a really office? lucky woman. Okay, good, John. Okay, one of the challenges we face is that uh, behavior, behavior science being introduced in our cash transfer programs is a new concept. And uh, for it to be adopted by the government, we need to do a lot of convince, uh, convincing. But the beauty of it is that when it was introduced, most of the senior government were, were there, and they were able to be taken through the process, so it's not difficult but we needed the buy-in of the, the higher policy makers so that they can be have their buy-in and we can also be able to adopt it. But when it came to the actual implementation, we had two challenges. One of them, as I mentioned, is that uh, most of our beneficiaries, they use the cash transfer money for consumption. Almost 90% of it they use for consumption. Now changing their mindset and telling them that you don't need to spend all that money on consumption, you can save, you can invest, and if you save and invest, finally you graduate yourself from poverty is uh, something we are trying now to do through the, the nudges. The second one is issues to do with the literacy of some of beneficiaries because they are, uh, the level of literacy is quite low, and also when it comes now to the language barrier for the officers who are doing the implementation, it's another challenge. But through the, um, the, the using the our officers who are in the field who understand the local concept better, they understand the local languages better, the interpretation. I think we are overcoming some of those challenges. But basically, the concept is well understood now, well accepted, yeah. Thank you. Ben, what do you think are the areas where, in terms of specific sectors or themes in development, where you think this has great promise? Particularly in areas where we are on the front line of working with people who suffer from various marginalizations. For us at DFID, the concept of leaving no one behind, which is one of the key paradigms of the sustainable development goals, is an important one. That's where I see real opportunity for behavioral design to chip in even more on its potential. A few years ago, I was working for the UN Development Program and had the privilege to work for half a year closely with the White House Social Science and Behavior Team under the Obama administration. And there, for example, my colleagues, Maya Shankar and Laurie Foster, they looked at, this is in the US, a program targeting low-income families for financial support, grants, so free money, for their children to be sent to college. And a traditional economist would probably argue, well, that's free money. You will see 100% uptake, right, because it's free. But in fact, only 8% of the eligible families went through the process to apply for that school grant. And just by looking from a user perspective at making it much easier to go through the process, reducing the number of forms from four to one, and working closely with um, users themselves, 
the White House team under President Obama was able to augment it by 20 percentage points. Now apply this to people living in poverty who are eligible for cash transfers or for other social protection programs, and we have huge opportunities to addressing leaving no one behind much more effectively. Thank you. Monica, in terms of, uh, and that sort of uh, connects with uh, Ben's uh, answer, in terms of areas which, in terms of areas where, which are amenable to behavioral nudges, what do you look for when you sort of engage with governments and do your problem solving? Yeah, I guess when we're defining kind of if a problem's behavioral or if we can address it through a behavioral intervention, well, we follow our methodology, which I pre presented briefly, but it's basically if you have a complex policy problem, try and break it down into very specific behaviors. And while you're doing that, try and identify what is it that you can measure. Can you measure something? Can you not? But also I think one thing that is key and that I think is fundamental in our international development work as well is that the two stages, the two first stages of our methodology, ta target and explore, are iterative. Because it can be the case that you've defined a behavioral objective. Say, for instance, we want to encourage uh, teachers to uh, be on time at school. And then you want to go and explore whether this is something that you could do. And I'm using that example because this comes from a project that we did in Peru a couple of years ago whereby we were trying to do something in the classroom space, space to motivate teachers. And we were really excited, brainstorming about the types of things that we could do to encourage teacher motivation within the classroom to show up as well. And when we went to the field, to some of the rural schools, we realized that a lot of the classrooms didn't have walls. They weren't really classrooms. They were taking the lesson outside. Some children were sharing a space as well. And it was not, not possible to do an intervention in the classroom space. Therefore, we adjusted our intervention and we leveraged a different communication channel. So it's always an iterative process whereby you're defining and narrowing down a very specific objective that you can measure. And then you're also seeing the context and seeing how that it interacts um, between each other. And I guess um, the other thing that I was thinking about as um, you were speaking and as you were asking me this question is that it can be that sometimes it feels that a problem is not really behavioral. So sometimes we think about very complex policy problems, but ultimately you can always break them down into specific behaviors and there's gonna be a behavior along the way. So we've been doing a lot of work, for instance, on, on corruption, which, which feels like an entrenched complex problem. But when you start breaking it down, it's about getting someone to report, it's about getting someone not to pay a bribe, it's about something very, very specific. So it's breaking those problems down into very specific behaviors. So one of the things which comes across is obviously unlike a lot of development interventions which are either products or solutions or something like that, this is effectively a process and to that extent there is a dynamic element to it. Uh, so Gato, uh, how do you sort of know whatever is being done is working or not? I mean like iteration is so central to this, mm -hmm. isn't it? And, and sort of there are likely to be fade out effects and so can you just talk about so Monica's actually set me up very helpfully because you know she described perfectly our initial phase of problem definition, which is exactly this, of narrowing things down to what specific behavior is happening at the moment um, that is relevant to the policy outcome and what do we want to be happening. And that's obviously the beginning stage and trying to then unpack through the process that we call behavioral mapping, what are the most likely drivers from a contextual or environmental point of view in terms of how the system is set up, how people are able to engage with it, how it's framed to them, all of these things help us identify some possible levers that we can pull, that some things that we can change, some things that we can perhaps augment in, in, in doing this. The one thing I would add is that for us, it's critically important, especially when we work with partners at scale, so governments, large NGOs, um, to also have a, an important sense of what it is that they are trying to achieve through the program. Because there might be something which is a very interesting behavioral problem, but if it's not a priority for the program, for the government, then even if we were able to come up with a very effective solution, it's unlikely to be taken up and scaled. So I think that piece, it's iterative, but it's also collaborative um, in terms of all of these pieces. And then, you know, how do we know something works? I mean, I think that Fundamentally, this is why this field is so tied up with testing. Um, and we want to be able to 
look for the actual effects of whatever intervention has been designed, usually in collaboration with our partners, and, and, and test it um, as rigorously as possible, ideally through a randomized field trial where we're able to actually tease out its effects. Now, one thing there, though, is that you know, RCTs, especially think about something like the cash transfer program that Mr. Kashigi runs, these are large programs. And, you know, testing an intervention initially at scale here would be an enormous undertaking and would require a great deal of a leap of faith, both from uh, our government partners and from us, to say this is what we should invest all of this money in. So we've been doing it in a much more iterative way, where we do smaller tests first and use the results from those to both help us refine what the intervention is and then test it on a larger scale once we have more initial evidence that at least what we expect to be uh, happening in the short run is happening. But you know, overall, I'd say testing is key. So in the sense, that sort of introduces a lot of moving parts into this whole thing, into the innovation. And given sort of weak state capacity and challenges associated with that, uh, Sartika, John, and Ben, I would request you also, like, how do you really, what do you think about how we can institutionalize or enable government adoption going beyond this or initial champions who are, ah, oh, this is good, let's do it. That's fine, you can do it for one, but we need this process to be embedded within the system. What, what, what do you think about this? So I think, oh, okay. Uh, That's a very good and difficult question, and also the answer. <laughs> so, um, to do you mean? Did you mean that mainstreaming the behavioral insights <coughs> and the making government? it making it mainstream within adoption, basically within going beyond just one intervention to the second, getting the same department to do a second, third, fourth. Yes, um, from my personal opinion, um, the top-down approach is um, the most effective. So you have to uh, you have to convince the top people. And if the top adopts, then the bottom will follow. But if you can't do that, um, then I would suggest uh, we start from our own unit and uh, try to find an issue, important issues in, uh, in your institution, in our institutions, and then get everybody involved in the medium and low level, and then <clears throat> explore and do this behavioral insight project. And then if we already get the result, hopefully the, the amazing result, then we sell them back to the top mm. people. So they, by that, they will be convinced to mainstreaming the behavioral insights, mm -hmm. the institution. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John? Yes. In Kenya, the cash transfer programs which we deliver <coughs> has an annual budget of about 300 million US dollars. And that's quite a substantial amount of money. And all that money is tax financed, meaning that the money is paid by the taxpayers. And for us to continue convincing the policymakers and other people, and especially the national parliament, to continue voting for that money, we need some element of social accountability. By showing that the money we are giving to the beneficiaries, it has value for money, they are using it. And this idea of the behaviors nudges to us it's a, is a blessing in these guys because we now have now to have a conversation, deliberate conversation with our beneficiaries so that we can be able now to change their mindsets. One of the things we are intending to do is that we institutionalize the behavior nudges within our policies and within our programs. Because currently some of the policies we are having, they are just about to lapse. As we are doing the review of the policies, as we are designing new programs, we should incorporate them as part and parcel of our programs. And then number two, we also need to, don't need to take behavior nudges as standalone activities to be undertaken. They need to be harmonized and co incorporated with any other program which we are implementing. So that as we are doing the budgeting and work planning and everything else, it doesn't appear that it's a standalone, but it is part and parcel of what we are doing. And then number three, we need to identify within the government itself, within the ministries, within the, the other ministries, like a team of champions 
the people who are going to champion the whole process <coughs> and convincing different stakeholders on the importance of this one. And once we identify those champions, we do their capacity building, we also change their mindset, we train them as facilitators, and then we use them now to propagate this agenda. And once, that, <coughs> and once we generate the evidence, we ensure that that evidence we have generated, we have documented it, and then we have also used it for planning and also for budgeting. Because as long as you have proper evidence which is properly documented, we will be able to convince anybody that this thing is working. And the only way it can do it is if our beneficiaries are able to save and they are also supposed to participate, to, to engage in productive investment, which is a value addition to the cash transfer they already get. Thanks. Ben, you know, in the sense, innovations sort of diffuse. I mean, you can't like do the stop down in many ways. So, given the sort of the complexity associated with this and other, in, when compared to other innovations, perhaps, is there something you, any observations about how you think this could diffuse more effectively uh, within public systems? Something I think a lot about, of course, working on, when you talk about innovations, you know, like, how do you make a mature practice on blockchain stick in a government department? How do you make a mature engagement on behavioral design stick in a government department? So how to bring some things from the margins to the mainstream is something I think a lot about. And I've seen a lot of, oh, let's invest in a couple of low-hanging fruit experiments by really good people going as an experiment to initial success, but going on a long journey nowhere because of staff turnover or political changes. So instead of like now laying out what could you do to start your first experiment, if you're interested in starting behavioral design in a government agency or a similar institution, I'd say first sit together and develop jointly with your champions a vision of adoption. What does the institution look like in five years? And then I personally like to use like a six item checklist. Um, it doesn't matter if this is for like blockchain or behavioral design. Me as a guy working in innovation, I ideally don't want to deal with behavioral insights in five years anymore because it's mainstream. Mm. So these six items is what institutional arrangements need to be in place for this thing to be fully adopted, including policies. And that can mean ethic guidelines. Uh, do we have an institutional review board for behavioral design, for behavioral insights work? It's links to business processes. One thing I learned working in innovation is if it's a, like, nice to have an add-on, it's only done by the super motivated people, but it needs to link to the core business processes. The third one is, what's the required evidence you need to have to get the political support? So not only the low-hanging fruit, but if the political priorities are, let's say, in corruption, you've got to have like, evidence in corruption. So think of a portfolio that to get to that required level of evidence. The capabilities is usually what we invest in first through toolkits that are not used by themselves in my experience. So think of like networks of peer support that's crucial and a like really well-designed service environment, particularly for newcomers in the public service I join. How do I get to know who can I draw on for support on behavioral design? That needs to be super well-designed. And lastly, measurement frameworks. Working in innovation, often it's measured, right? But innovation only understood as new stuff. And if only the new stuff is incentivized, we are not incentivized to bring stuff to the mainstream. So that's something, if you're in a position to challenge that, like think of the right indicators to also incentivize through the right indicators to bring things from the margins to the mainstream. Innovation is too often understood as like the novel stuff only, and that's too short. And then lastly, more on the cultural side, what are incentives, what are continuous messages from the top down, and what are also narratives in your administration, right? Are there stories of people having changed stuff? And lastly, an insider tip, when I sit with my team, and I don't have the top-down support that you mentioned is needed. What we do is like we draw a power map. Nobody is allowed to photograph that because it has the name of like managers on there. Those who support <laughs> us, those who don't support us, assumptions like who might influence them, and then thinking through like who do we need to get on our side to influence who to eventually get the most support that we can get. A bit Machiavellian, but I have very good experiences with this. So just a little behind the scenes um, potential support for how do you like get to the right political level that you need. Thank you. That's something which everybody could copy good yeah. in their organizations. <laughs> so s several questions have uh, come. So let's get to this. How do you actually build capacity? Is it through a specific course on behavioral biases or in interventions design? 
and how do you measure capacity building? Uh, Monica Sogato, one of you can. I guess we have different methods to go about capacity building. It starts from an introductory workshop to running a project together to going through all the stages. And for instance, as, as I was uh, saying um, with the Guatemala example, what we've done is running a couple of projects together and now they're running their own projects, giving them ad hoc feedback on the design of their interventions. Um, so basically our workshops are all structured to follow all the steps of our methodology. And in one or two days, we try to make it so that everyone attending comes in with a policy challenge they want to address that they face on their day-to-day -day lives in their work. <coughs> and then we break it down to a behavioral project. We then try and do an exploratory phase within the workshop and come up with ideas, do a brainstorming session where we explain some of the behavioral biases and explain how they can be relevant to each case specifically and design solutions with them on the spot which I think is quite a good method to start uh, doing capacity building. And on the measurement side of things, that is a fantastic question we're kind of struggling with at the moment. So if you have any recommendations for us, that'd be great. Um, we basically think about the teams, the people, the people that we've trained, um, how far they've gone. So we try and think about the baseline a little bit of, as well. Was their data available already? Did they know about behavioral science already? And how far we've taken them from when they, where they were to where they are now? Uh, but we don't have a standardized measurement yet of capacity building as such. Yeah, I don't know if there's something you would like to add. I was just actually thinking also from from Ben's comments earlier that. I think each case is different in terms of what the measures of capacity are, but you, you know it when you see it. So for instance, I would say, think of the SBST, which was the Social and Behavioral Sciences team in the White House. I don't think they knew going in what um, sustainable adoption of these things in the American government would look like, but what they got was that having done a bunch of experiments and shown that this stuff worked within government, they got an executive order from President Obama which said it's now a mandate for federal agencies to consider human behavior and use behavioral insights in whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And that has actually allowed this unit and its work to sort of survive the change of administration because now it's sort of written in to the way they're supposed to be doing their business. And of course, someone would come and rescind that order, but nobody has bothered to do that yet, right? So I think that's interesting. And I think in terms of capacity building, I think, again, linking back to the whole kind of how is this taken up at scale, there's a lot that is, you know, we can we can think about doing workshops and tools and all of those things are important, but all of these things have to be done in ways that really work with the psychology of the adoptees, which in this case are people within government. So how do we make it easy? How do we make them be able to get kind of positive feedback on the things they're doing and to be recognized for doing what is often very difficult and very kind of um, targeted work, which is very different from the work that they may be doing on, on a routine basis. So I think all of that can help in adoption and capacity as well. Now there's a specific question to you. Uh, this is, Research suggests that pure cash transfers without connecting them to incentives is not helpful in eliminating poverty. I guess this is too broad. I mean, but like, do you have anything? I mean, uh, I'm probably not even the best person to speak yeah, about I, this. We have, uh, we do have people, major experts on this um, from the World Bank, for example, in the room. But I would, I mean, from my reading of the literature, actually, there is pretty good evidence that cash transfers by themselves do have very significant effects on a lot of things we care about, about poverty. But what I think we would say is that's exactly why we're doing the work about incorporating behavioral interventions into cash transfers, because the full potential of these cash transfers cannot be unlocked until we really find ways to connect with the way people use this money and their understanding of it and how they are able to connect it with their goals, um, which usually are very well aligned with programs because people also want to escape poverty and to do better by their children and to have better lives for their future generations. So I think that sort of speaks to the importance of this. Uh, uh, one of the things, just going back to the previous question, uh, you were saying about this, like, iterate, get some success, and then ubiquity, and then, like, integration into the systems. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense, like, given where you are now uh, in both Indonesia and Kenya, how long do you think is a reasonable assessment before you think this will stick 
in some reasonably reversible way. Uh, Satika and John. Even where you are, like for example in Kenya, you're close to scaling up. So like if, if the whole scaffolding of external support just mm -hmm. is withdrawn gradually, uh, will it survive? Well, as long as the head of the research team in PPJ Seca is me, then it will be long live the behavioral insights. Then. No, um, <clears throat> like I said before that we, um, we, we are uh, integrating this behavioral insight in our evidence-based tools toolbox. So, um, and it, it, it also aligned with our management uh, wants that uh, they want more evidence-based policy making in our institution. And we have already this amazing result with the, um, with the arrears problem. So um, we are close to scaling it up, but since we have the next um, project with BIT with the companies too. So we are thinking, we are having a discussion to integrate the, uh, integrate the, the result of the <coughs> first project email into the uh, second project. Uh, so yeah, I think it will live forever and ever as long as the result had is me. Let me take a take on that one is that based on the first question you had asked, we have also realized in Kenya that cash transfer alone cannot get people out of poverty because there are so many dynamics which make people to be poor. One of them is the poverty of the mind. So we need first of all to change that, uh, that mindset. And as long as we continue giving them the cash transfer without an additional product, they will still live in poverty. So ourselves, what we have decided now, we have come up with a cash transfer, a cash plus agenda. A cash plus agenda whereby, other than giving them the cash transfer, what other extra things do you need to, to give them? And one of them, we have now introduced the issue of to mentoring and coaching. So that even if you give them the, the money, can you mentor them, can you coach them? And once you mentor and coach them, introduce a product like financial inclusion or economic empowerment. So that once you, you, you empower them with the knowledge and skills on economic empowerment, and that way now they are able now to use part of that money for productive investment. And now this concept of behavior, inter, inter, uh, behavior intervention nudges, it has come at the right time. And from the initial results from where we have done the, the piloting, we have seen that it is working. So I believe that if we combine it with already existing programs and the conversations and the dialogue which is going on now with this product. I know that within the next five years, we will start now seeing new, 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 new changes, new impact, and new development. So currently, we have piloted in one region. We are now moving to 10 new regions where we want now to do the, the, the scale up. And the way we are, we are doing it is such that we have divided, looked at our country into different geographical dimensions. There are those people in the rural areas those people in the marginal areas, those people in the urban areas, and those people in the uh, um, peri-urban areas. So we come up with the different team interventions for different those places. And then after that, once now we do the evaluation, we will, check, we will be able to check on where maybe we have got good successes. Because you cannot apply uh, a standard program for all the areas because we also have got the, the geographical dimensions and other things. But as we are optimistic that in the next five years, you will see positive results. Uh, ben, uh, you talked about those uh, six uh, sort of elements to ensure or like increase the likelihood of uh, this innovation sticking. One of the last questions is about this quick wins. Huh? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether that was one of the uh, six things, but like quick wins sounds intuitively appealing. Like try to get some of those do a landscape scan, get into quick wins, and try to establish success, and like like the diffusion. Do you think that is, I mean, do you have anything to say about that in terms of anything which you have come across in behavioral science? Like, they say the whole of behavioral science exploded because of the urinals in Amsterdam airport, uh, which then everybody started replicating, and like nudges and... When we speak about making it stick, that leads to change management. And I do think that 
scholars like John Carter provide really good frameworks for institutionalizing new elements for change management and investing in quick wins is one of the key pillars, right? So I'm not going to contest that. And I know from working with peers and other governments how hard it can be to kickstart things. So I'm not going to challenge get quick wins off the ground. Also, Jogato said, you know, get the people energized and incentivized to want to move things for the entrepreneurial spirit. In addition, though, I would love to see, particularly in the global south, like a little bit of a redefinition of behavioral insights uh, with new elements and new perspectives, basing it on positive deviant behavior in communities and designing um, interventions around that, for example. We see ingenious local innovators solving problems mm -hmm. with the means they have at their availability. And um, what I see a little bit is a lot of replication of tax trials that BIT so geniusly pioneered in the UK. And I'm hungering a little bit for a couple of novel approaches, particularly coming out of the Global South in behavioral design. I know that sounds vague, um, but from a different perspective, we'd be very happy to have those conversations and support entrepreneurial partners across the world in that. A couple of minutes, you, maybe you can talk about it when we well, listen. <laughs> so I think we've like sadly running out of time. So uh, I'll request all uh, the panelists very quickly, 30 seconds for, I mean, this is like, I this is the part of a panel discussion I really hate because you can't summarize what is obviously very complex into 30 seconds. But nevertheless, for anyone in the audience who wants to start exploring how to apply nudges in their ministries, for development programs, what would be your sort of advice? I'm gonna take the liberty to just answer two of those questions very quickly though, because I'm loving the questions. But I see that you ask whether it's possible to find expertise and capacity in developing countries to create these teams. And the answer is absolutely. There are believers everywhere in the world, like there are people that know about behavioral science and they know and they have the capacity to run experiments. So I think you can definitely find them if you look for them, which I, I hope answers that question. And then just very quickly on the closing remarks, I guess uh, we run a workshop with GIF uh, Ideas 42 and our partners two days ago, where we were trying to think about what is the future of all of this and how do we make sure that it's sustainable in the long term. And I think we all shared the dream that in like 20 years time, it, the world will be a place where evidence-based policy making and behavioral science will be the norm rather than the exception in, in public policy. And I think the way we get there and what we're kind of been discussing today is by changing mindsets and, and, and governments, getting civil servants to think more experimentally, getting civil servants to think about behaviors, to introducing that more realistic model of human behavior into policy design. So I think these are baby steps, but hopefully in 20 years time, we'll be able to look back and see, uh, look, for instance, at uh, policy making based on intuition, like we look at medicine in Asian times nowadays. Um, so just like I said that uh, we have to start simple, I think. So uh, start in on your own unit and, um, find the important issues and explore them and get everybody uh, uh, join in and find the most simplest and the most cost effective intervention when you uh, exploring the alternative of the intervention so that the people around you uh, can see that uh, by doing the sim changing the simple thing you can uh, generate an enormous, uh, amazing result, just like what our, what I and BI, what we and BIT did with the email intervention in our first project. Thanks. One thing very quickly is that I think we haven't talked uh, much about what we found to be incredibly valuable in this work, which is the role of development partners like the World Bank, because there's a durability of presence and expertise there, which really helps to augment what capacity is available and what is needed in the country governments where we work. But in terms of your closing remark question, I would say there is an increasing wealth of stuff that has been done. And what we need, obviously, are better ways for people to access that knowledge. You know, So we've been trying to do things like set up a website where 
anyone who's done these kinds of interventions, it's not just about saying this was the result, but it's about actually documenting exactly what was done, what materials were used, and most importantly, who did it? So who can you contact, perhaps in another government, perhaps at BIT, perhaps at Ideas 42, perhaps at a university at the World Bank, to actually learn how to do something like that again? And so hopefully as the range of that expands, it'll speak to a lot of different priorities that people in different governments want to try and address, because to me that's the most important thing. If it's not addressing the things that people care about, it's not going to be durable and not going to stick, and it's frankly not going to be that important. So that's the main thing. My advice is that uh, generate credible evidence, and with that credible evidence, sensitize the policy makers, get their buy-in, and if possible also get the political goodwill of the government so that these activities can <coughs> be done. And one of the <coughs> Keywords we have been using and telling the Kenyan government, and which has made us to do the strikes, is that we always tell them that cash transfer programs, they are not an expenditure. They are not a cost, but they are an investment. The same way we invest with the infrastructure and other things, we are also investing on the poor and vulnerable. And the moment you invest on your poor and vulnerable, they become productive, you increase their age, the longevity, and then at the end of the day, they become part and parcel of the people who are building the nation other than only receiving. So they also build the economy of the country. So our key word is that it's not a cost, it's not an expenditure, but an investment. Thank you. I'll make three points, and the first one is on behalf of DFID, and it's to think critically as I believe that no nudge can fix a broken system. So really critically reflecting what is the political context that you work in? What's the even only perceived legitimacy of the part of government vis-a-vis -vis the citizens that you work in? Is that the right intervention area for nudges? But the other two is one is internally looking and building what you said, assemble the team. And there, very often I see that it's more the pioneers getting together, but you need town planners and settlers. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have people from the back office in your team. Very often people who are not naturally drawn to that kind of work, but they can make or break the success. Very often it's just a few entrepreneurs, but they have the same profile, so it needs to be a heterogeneous team with a couple of town planners and settlers. And externally, we all signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, right? That's not the UN agenda, that's our agenda of all world's government. And that stands for values. So the last tip is be really investing in the transparency of behavioral design vis-a-vis -vis the citizens as much as you can, including citizen in the design, and stand for the values of the SDGs, gender equality, like advanced things that are crucial for human well-being um, and for the goals that we all work together for. Thank you very much. That's a nice uh, set of summary from all five participants. I can only echo uh, what Monica said. Uh, hopefully in 20 years, 2039, we don't have a BX conference talking about the need to diffuse uh, behavioral interventions and this would have diffused and become mainstream in... Uh, 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 in, 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 in not just in public systems, but across the world. Thank you very much to everyone for uh, uh, being patient and listening to this uh, panel. Thank you very much to the panelists, and thank you very much to BIT for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you.